Well, starting here, we've got a quite a tall hedge. That this is Daniel Kitch. It's the first time he's ever walked down this street. He's never seen it before and never will, at least not with his eyes. There's a building behind it, not, a cl not closely behind it, I'd say maybe 10 metres away. That's because Daniel's blind. There's a... Sorry. <laughs> there's, a, there's a... There's a person. <laughs> he was born with retinoblastoma, a rare eye cancer that affects young children. By the time Daniel was just 13 months old, both his eyes had been removed. There's a parked vehicle behind a tree, a small tree. And yet, his ability to navigate and describe an unfamiliar area like this is remarkable. Here the hedge has dropped out, and actually, right at the dropping of the hedge is a big sort of a thick structure there. This is not just a hedge, it's like a clump of trees or something just kind of smashed in together. There's a low fence here, clearly, and the building's still behind it. Uh, he does it using echolocation. The, the fence has disappeared momentarily. There's an entrance there and a passageway between the buildings. The fence returns here and it actually Looks like it curves away. So just as bats like or dolphins emit sounds um, and use the reflected yeah. echoes to navigate dark spaces, Daniel produces mouth clicks to reveal what's around him. Parked vehicle there. It's a specific form uh, of echolocation he calls flash sonar. Our version of echolocation, if you will, flash sonar, means that a flash of sound, in our case, a flash of energy is used to solicit echoes from the environment that are then used for navigation. More hedge, except it's really more like a tree hanging over the, over the fence. We all get passive clues about our surroundings from the random ambient noises that bounce around us. But Daniel actively interrogates that space to get the information he wants when he wants it. Active echolocation is a very specific form of self-directed and self-determined echolocation to optimize the quality of echoes from the environment. And it is very much under the control of the user. It's given Daniel an independence and freedom of movement that most blind people don't have and enables him to travel the world alone teaching the skills to others. In these large distances, Christian, the louder your click, the better. Now, science is beginning to explore how human echolocation works and the extent to which other people can follow Daniel's lead. It's something that people have been aware of. Different philosophers, psychologists have been aware of for a very long time. It's how the blind seem able to perceive at a distance in ways that does, don't make sense to us. But up until, say, about the 1940s, this kind of distance sense that the blind had was misunderstood. People thought it was coming from air pressure, or they even talked about face vision, the idea that somehow the, the nerves on your face could detect objects at a distance. And this was because you sense what you sense, you don't sense how you sense. So, so the blind people who were able to sense at a distance couldn't even describe how they were doing it. So in the 1940s, some psychologists in the United States began to actually experiment with the blind. And they did things like made them wear socks on carpet. Um, and it, they found out that their ability to detect objects dropped off because there was no echoes coming from their shoes. And so starting in the 1940s and 50s, psychologists became aware that this perception at a distance of the blind was through sound. But how the human brain turns these sounds into images remained unstudied until researchers peered into the brains of Daniel and fellow echolocator Brian Bushway. One of the most important questions that we were interested in was what parts of Daniel's brain were activated uh, when he was listening to the echoes coming back from his mouth clicks from the environment. Uh, I mean, we knew that blind people often use a visual part of their brain that's not being activated anymore by their eyes uh, for other purposes, and we wondered whether or not this would be the case for echolocation as well. The difficulty was 
that imaging their brains required them to lie in the cramped tunnel of an fMRI machine with nothing to echolocate. So instead, they asked Daniel and Brian to echolocate a series of objects and recorded the clicks and their reflected echoes with miniature microphones placed in their ear canals. They produced the clicks, listened to the echoes, we recorded them. Then we played those sounds back to them uh, in a, a mixed up order to see whether or not they knew what they were. And they did, they were incredibly uh, good at uh, identifying them. Daniel was able to correctly identify the scene 99% of the time. Brian, who'd been blind since the age of 14, had an 82% strike weight. But it wasn't just their own clicks and echoes that made sense to them. It was really quite amazing. They could indeed understand each other's clicks and echoes. Although, uh, I must say that when Daniel put on Brian's headphones and listened to his sounds, uh, what he said immediately was, oh my goodness, I feel so tall. Because, of course, Brian was uh, almost a foot taller than Daniel. And, of course, the sound uh, would arrive a little later from the ground level. I've always known that perspective makes a huge difference. When we work with little kids, for example, and we work with them in various environments, we, we get down at their level so that we can hear the environment the way they hear it. Having proven that Daniel and Brian could effectively see the images in the recordings, the researchers then analysed their brain activity as they listened. Daniel's visual cortex lit up in response. Brian's was also active, although much less so. It was interesting that the visual cortex was activated, but what was even more interesting was that uh, when we compared sound files that contained clicks and echoes with sound files that contained only the clicks, that is, we chopped out the echoes and replaced it with background noise, then we found that the visual cortex was incredibly sensitive to the echoes. Normal sounds didn't have the same increased effect on the visual system. It seems there was something special about the click and echo combination that was feeding the spatial information directly into an area of the visual system known as V1. For sighted people, V1 creates a spatial map that directly reflects the eye's retina. It would seem to be a wonderful place for echolocation to play out uh, so that the echoes in some sense could capture uh, space in a, a framework that's already been set up for analyzing space. We're beginning with a hedge, so I'm gonna indicate that out here, there's a building that starts right about here and it's further back and... Indeed, the sound waves that reflect into the ears here. possess many of the same right. properties as the light waves that reflect into the eyes. The languages they speak are similar enough for the visual system to interpret both. That would help explain how Daniel can extract enough spatial information from the sound waves to identify large objects around him. There's a gap between this tree and the car, and then this tree is kind of, in fact, I want to make it, it's almost on top of the car. And create a 3D mental map of the scene, then sketch it from an aerial sort point of, of view. I think echolocation uh, is redefining uh, our sense of what it means to be visual cortex. A better description might be spatial cortex, that is, cortex that's exquisitely tuned to the spatial layout uh, of the world. My visual cortex is responding the way a visual cortex does when presented with information from which it can extract an image. It's doing its job. This is really Christian Kuro Mahalis, a congenitally blind student at Insight Education right. Centre. Which AFL team do you go for? When he's not your regular eight-year-old sports nut, he's an echolocator with skills well advanced for his age. Oh, there is something above you. Yeah, I can echo that. I can't stop my fault. Cell phone. Today, Christian's on a mission to explore areas outside his school where neither he nor Daniel has been before. We're passing a... Uh, another car. Another car. He's trying to put a puzzle together. He's trying to put the environment together, the near and the big picture. 
And he had questions about what was out there, how it relates to the school, how it relates to the road. But we're going this way. Do you think we're going towards Enterprise Avenue? He wants to know. And actually, I think they're pretty good questions because, I mean, wouldn't we all like to know? What the heck is going on out there? Well, I think that's the freeway, so we should be going in the right direction. It isn't easy, and Christian eventually gets disoriented. Where am I? Okay. Try, now, you, give, give us your power click, see if you can hear the building still. No, no building. In the empty expanse of a half-constructed new football oval. Well, yeah. But this is the third time Daniel has worked with Christian, and he knows Christian's abilities can and should be stretched to the limit. This looks more like a His personality sand. drives him to know, to understand, to experience, and he has no fear. And he doesn't mind a bit of mishap. I mean, I've seen him crash and burn on a number of occasions, and it does not faze him. He just doesn't care. All right, here's a hill. Follow me. All right. Those are pretty powerful combination of characteristics that will just drive a person forward. Yep, we're heading towards the building. In fact, Daniel believes that without pushing his boundaries, Christian would probably be like the vast majority of blind people who don't actively echolocate, because the skill doesn't come easily. Deprivation of sight alone doesn't create echolocation. Yeah. This is not okay, so automatic result of being blind. Because your brain doesn't have vision to work with does, doesn't mean that you automatically start picking up sound as a way of detecting space. Something clicks back at us. Like one of the plants. Try clapping. Oh, like the playground. The human brain by default actually tries to get rid of these echoes. So if a person listens to two sounds in rapid succession, the percept will be dominated by the first sound, which means that they're ignoring the second. Or they're, So if this is a click and an echo, for example, this means that they would ignore the echo. See if you can get that to sing back at you. If not, we'll just get closer. The good thing is, though, that people can be trained to basically be more sensitive to the echoes, so we can untrain this echo suppression. What can you still hear? Is it bouncing back? Yeah. When a person echolocates, they're dependent on timing information and sound. How long do these sounds take to come back to you? That helps to form that image. Is it bouncing back from the same distance or further away? Um, further away. Further. Daniel and other echolocators were tested on their ability to distinguish these minute variations in the timing of sounds. They were all uh, absolutely terrific, uh, much better than we would predict for their age, and Daniel in particular was outstanding. In fact, our computer could not make the stimuli fast enough for Daniel. In the same way, many blind people learn to listen to speech at high speeds just by catching up on the news or their Facebook feed. So do expert echolocators have an extreme natural ability for the task or does practice make perfect? They have trained themselves to become outstanding in this ability. I don't think it's freakish at all. I think it's a matter of relying on hearing sensitivity and the kinds of listening that they do every day to, to navigate their environments. It takes experimentation. It takes a person trying to use it, becoming more and more skillful at it. And it can be short-circuited by a number of things. You know, maybe your hearing isn't quite as good. Maybe you make, when you make a noise as a kid, your parents or your, your siblings tell you to stop making that noise. You're drawing attention to yourself. Maybe you're overprotected or you're just afraid to get around and so you never try it out. Go right, this way. A lot of these kids are heavily supported, so they'll never really be stranded or high and dry. I mean, if you shut down your entire navigational system, someone's gonna step in and navigate you. So. Essentially, in a way, we've withdrawn the need to develop that skill. Yeah, we're heading towards the building. We kind of undo all of that in our training, bit by bit, to reawaken and reactivate the navigational system. So just give it a try. Okay. Let's see what happens. 
That's, no, that's actually pretty good. Everyone's click's gonna be slightly different, but the click's going to have certain qualities which optimize it for echo extraction. Try it again. And you can get it to bounce. I heard that. Yeah, listen. So it has to be variable in volume from very soft to very loud. You have to be able to scan with it. It wants to be sharp, it wants to be bright. It's that sharp transient edge is very important because uh, mathematically it's what creates a very broad spectrum of frequencies. How can I fit through there? That's not the way. It sharply defines the surroundings as the echoes bounce back. When those reflections are maximized, what you end up with is a kind of three-dimensional fuzzy geometry. And it's fuzzy in the sense that it doesn't have the exact sharp-edged definition that optical vision will give you. The clarity of vision that enables bats to hunt small insects using echolocation is possible because they use very high-frequency ultrasonic clicks and echoes. And the reason for that is the shorter wavelength means the sound actually comes back at a finer grain detail. Research suggests the visual acuity of echolocators is more equivalent to a sighted person's peripheral vision. But it's a different medium to vision, one that's devoid of colour and light. Brian Bushway has seen the world from both points of view. He was sighted until the age of 14, but is now an expert blind echolocator working with Daniel. The experience of using echolocation, to me, reminds me of a visual experience. Yeah, I mean, for me, I use these words like brightness and it illuminates more, and there is no light, but all of a sudden, there's more clarity in my awareness and understanding of the objects around me. For example, you could tell that there's a person there. People are like beautiful blobs. And, it, and it's really cool. It's like all of our young childhood was all about learning to interpret these patterns of light. And then you called it a tree. We're doing the same thing sonically. We're teaching the brain how to interpret these patterns of sound. And with practice and repetition, the brain just automatically goes, oh yeah, that's the familiar sonic signature of a tree. Brian believes that his own acoustic vocabulary, as he calls it, isn't as large as Daniel's. The refinement of his acoustic images are much more clear than mine, I assume, but on a practical day-to-day -day using echoes for mobility purposes, I don't think many people see a difference. And that really is the hope in all of this, is how adaptable our brain is. A person can lose their vision at any age, and there still is so much room for the brain to adapt we're just figuring out the potential of this. Under the tips of this the is probably problem. related to uh, when they went blind, uh, when they learned to echolocate, and their own particular abilities. Uh, and by studying these people, we'll get some insight uh, into just how plastic uh, the brain is and what the constraints are uh, on allowing those changes to occur. That's a power click, and that's a fantastic <laughs> click. I can't even do that. In general, as blind people age, their ability to process brief sounds doesn't decline to the same extent as sighted people. An advantage if you're late to start. Where she is. Right there. Yep. Hello, darling. Julianne Bell only began to use active echolocation four years ago when she was 38. What's that noise? And I like that noise. She'd been inspired by media reports on Daniel and organised for him to give a series of workshops in Australia. Since then, she's developed her own skills and is now featured in media reports herself. While I always had fairly good, what we call orientation and mobility skills, I was extremely anxious travelling independently. I was very nervous of, of losing my way and Echolocation has allowed me to have such a broader picture of my environment that even if I am uncertain for any moment where I might be, I'm able to use echolocation to establish what's around me and to work out where I need to go. Letting go of somebody's arm after holding onto it for such a long time, it will be the greatest gift that you give them. 
Julianne now runs the organisation World Access for the Blind Australia. It's a sister company of Daniel's not-for-profit in the US. Professor Greg Downey is a director. To me, the most exciting element is the way it, it completely turns our understanding of disability on its head. You know, instead of seeing this community as a disabled community, we now see them as a community which is cultivating a skill which is, is very rare and very valuable and that they need to teach each other. So in some ways, I feel like I'm watching a sensory community form. Brought something for you guys. Here you go. <laughs> so studying somebody like Daniel is really exciting to me. Watching him lead a group to explore the edge of what's possible. <laughs> Our brain is immensely adaptable. It's immensely plastic. I believe one of the first and foremost functions of our brain is to understand our environment and facilitate interaction with our environment. And the brain will stop at almost nothing to make that happen. 